Good morning. Thank you for singing with us. And uh, my name is Dan. Honored to serve as pastor here this morning. And um, um, grateful to, to um, get a chance to talk about what the Christian worldview is and what the Bible reveals about who God is. And um, I know that you probably didn't come here to learn how to be broke, ungrateful, and envious. Am I right? And there is a way to be broke, ungrateful, and envious, in my opinion. In my opinion, if you just go with the flow and you live the way that the culture trains us to think and live, this is what I've discovered, that if you just go with the flow and you use the principles the world teaches you by nature, it is very easy and very possible to live broke, ungrateful, and envious. And in some ways, all you have to do is manage what you have like you own it. And in some ways, all you have to do is keep it all to yourself and believe that you're entitled to it. And in some ways, all you have to do is invest, only invest in your earthly treasure, stuff that we get to have and keep and use here on earth. And by all means, never ask, what does God have for me? What does he want for me? What is his idea on how to live and prioritize what I have. Jesus describes, not surprisingly, Jesus describes a radically different way to live. And I, and I believe this, if we miss that, we find ourselves just going with the flow and living the way everybody lives and potentially ending up the, the way a lot of people end up, broke, ungrateful, and envious. And Jesus says, for my disciples, there's a radically different way to live. And he teaches answers to questions that change our life. And one of the questions that he addresses is this. How does money and wealth management reveal who truly belongs to Jesus and who doesn't? So in his teaching, Jesus says, there's a way for you to know. There are evidences, and I'm going to describe these evidences to you, and money and wealth management reveals who belongs to me. And who doesn't? And he illustrates it with a story. Where are my story folks? You love a good story. Anybody just love a good story? Now, would you admit it if you didn't? Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird to say, I hate stories? That's kind of a weird thing. Maybe. Uh, oh, maybe not, though. Maybe people are like, no, give me facts, information. Right? I can, I can understand that, ish. Okay, so look how he starts. Jesus here, in the, uh, recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, he has, starts teaching with a story. Look at this. Again, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip, and he is going to here begin to teach principles of managing wealth, stuff that we have, stuff that we own, stuff that we earn. You may have heard this passage described as the parable of the talents. Anybody um, have heard it that way, the parable of the talents? And it's set in a cultural and economic context of first century Palestine, first century uh, Middle East Arab culture uh, right by the, um, um, the Gaza Strip there. And this story, through this story... Jesus is describing his expectations to his disciples. So his disciples are listening to him teach, and he's describing his expectations. And his expectations is that they take an active role in managing what God has entrusted to them. And he's describing these expectations using the parable of the talents. And I want you to look for this big idea. Here's the big idea that's going to kind of comes to the surface and stands out in this story. Disciples are stewards who are held responsible to manage God's gifts. We just summarize it this way, time, talents, and treasure with faithfulness and responsibility. Now, this word steward here, I want you to pay attention to this word because this is the Bible word. 
This is the right word. I also believe it's a word that isn't really common in our culture and is easy for us to kind of like miss what it means, right? I don't know how often you heard the word, hear the word steward. I don't very often, but I know it's a Bible word. So this is a good word to use. It helps us learn Bible theological language. God's words help us learn his language. But it might help us to understand it in a word that we use. And that word that we use, which would be very similar to steward, is manager. Manager. And the question, of course, is manager of what? Well, Jesus is going to describe managing time, prioritizing time in our lives for God's kingdom, being a part of living, investing, and existing in and for God's kingdom. Also, you'll notice along the way in the Gospels, he teaches managing talents, God-given special abilities to serve his church and to serve the community, and also managing treasure, our income, our money, and doing so with giving and offerings and wise financial management. And so, Jesus here is going to start with a foundational principle. You ready for the foundational principle? Everything's built on this. You can't build, you are? Let's get it. Let's get it then. Here we go. Disciples are managers, not owners. You got to let this sink in. We have to grasp this. This is the basics. This is fundamental building blocks for a life of existing uh, in and thriving in God's kingdom. When you're a disciple, here's the basics. Disciples are stewards or, in our culture, managers, not owners. Well, what does that mean? Well, you might recognize this story as the parable of the talents because talents is what this story Jesus is going to tell us about. And he starts it this way. He says, he called together his servants and entrusted his money. In the parable of the talents, it's a different translation. It says he entrusted them with talents. And what do we think of when we think of talents? Oh, he, he, he made sure that his disciples had a great singing voice. Really, really good actor. Probably could throw a football 60 yards. But this is what talents mean. It means money. Jesus here, this concept of a talent means that Jesus is telling a story about a master who entrusted his money. And a talent in the first century was not a skill. It was not an ability. It was a large monetary unit. One talent would be a bag of silver. And it's probably difficult for us to to actually grasp this, but a bag of silver would be the equivalent of, get ready for this, 20 years of wages for a servant or a laborer. 20 years in a bag of silver. And it indicates that the master is turning over a significant amount of wealth to his servant. And it represents, as you can imagine, great responsibility. I remember, does anybody remember in Bayberry Tri-R drugs? Do you remember phase drugs? But not Tri-R? Where are my Bayberry people? Oh my goodness. My heart just stopped for two seconds. Did I, did I live that? Is there no Tri-R drugs? But I remember going to try our drugs, phase drugs, and one of the most exciting things that would ever happen to me is that my parents would give me a dollar, and they would say, buy yourself some candy. A dollar. Do you know what you could get, by the way, for a dollar back then, candy-wise? I mean, I have a bag of Big League Chew or whatever. And there was no sense of responsibility carrying that dollar around. It was all a thrill. However, several years later when I was leaving my university last week, we got called down to the financial aid office and everybody who borrowed money had to sign a promissory note. And they were spinning, they'd spin the promissory note around, they slid it to me, and I said, what am I signing? I said, promissory note. And I was like, well, what is that? 
well, this is what you owe the government. And I said, is there an amount? Oh, sure. And they turned the amount around and slid it over to me. And I was like, is that right? Well, you borrowed it, pal. And all of a sudden, like I got short of breath. I could feel pressure on my chest. And I was like, do you know I'm 21 years old? Who loaned me this money? Who did this to me? And I felt like I left there shorter, smaller, carrying the weight of borrowing money from the government because it was a significant amount of money. And I could tell you, that amount of money, nowhere near what was given to these servants. Nowhere near. And I would imagine they take this money from their master. Ooh, it's a lot. It's a lot. And one of the reasons why it feels like a lot and why it's a lot of responsibility is it's because it is not theirs. It's someone else's. This indicates a significant amount of resources that are being handed off to these servants. Jesus says this. He gave five bags of silver to one. Five bags of silver. Two bags of silver to another. And one bag of silver to the last. Dividing it in proportion to their abilities. That's kind of depressing. The one guy's like, wait, what? (laughs) How did this happen? You don't want to know. Then he left on his trip. So, five... Two, one. It all belongs to the master. And he trusts his servants with his wealth. And he emphasizes that what they have received, um, dividing it to the proportion, then he left. Oh, he gave five bags, then two bags, then one bag. He gave it to them. They didn't earn it. They didn't work for it. This doesn't belong to them. What they receive is not theirs to own, right? The manager gave it to them to manage, or the, uh, the um, master gave it to them to manage. Everything, here's the principle, everything belongs to God, and as stewards, we are entrusted with management. This would be a very, very familiar story in the culture that Jesus is teaching because there was a culture of stewardship. What does that mean? Well, there was a relationship in this period of time between owners, masters, and servants. And in this particular parable, it reflects a very common reality in the ancient world that stewards often were entrusted with managing household finances, property, resources, agricultural estates, and it was an expectation of loyalty, devotion, gratitude and competence that these servants would be entrusted and take care of the owner's wealth. Very common economic and social practice in ancient Mediterranean world that the masters would go away for a long journey leaving everything behind to be stewarded, mastered by someone who doesn't own it. Very common. Very easy for them to understand this. And Stewardship here, as Jesus is teaching it, is this. Stewardship is about maximizing God's glory through the, through the um, generous use of his gifts. This reminds me of the psalmist. The psalmist writes as he's kind of like worshiping and writing this song, psalm song to God, and he says, the earth, it's the Lord's, and everything in it. In the Old Testament, there's periods of time where you kind of hear the Israelites saying, we've got silver, and God's like, no, you don't. Silver, that's mine. Oh, we've got so much gold now. Uh Uh-uh, you don't. Everything that you have, that gold, belongs to me. That's um, not uncommon. Now, if we grasp this, if we grasp this, it transforms. It literally transforms the way we view every aspect of our lives. Because Jesus' parable teaches that his disciples are entrusted with his wealth. They're entrusted with his money. They're entrusted with his resources. And the responsibility in the kingdom of God, whether through financial resources or spiritual gifts or opportunities to serve, it's expected that disciples are faithful managers of something that doesn't belong to them. 
So, reflect on what you have been... And by the way, the, the idea here is that these servants know that the master's going to come back and the, the master's going to hold them accountable. It's known. That, in other words, they're not like, oh, let's get, this, let's get this guy out of here so we can keep this. They know that there's a period of time where eventually the master is going to come back and hold them accountable. accountable. So for just a, just a second, just reflect for a second or two on what you've been entrusted with. When you think about it, think about your, your bank account, your home, your shelter, your, um, your vehicle, your vehicle. You know, you open your fridge and your pantry, and by God's grace, what we need is, is there. Think about your abilities, your time. And then, it's worth asking this question, each of us. What is one reason that it's, that it's possible that I'm not as generous as I want to be? What's one possible reason I'm not as generous as I want to be? It's possible that deep down, I believe... I own these things. It's possible that deep down in our heart, we believe what I have belongs to me. I earned it. I keep it. It's very possible that at the fundamental level, the reason why we wish we were a little more generous like other people, but we can't get ourselves there is because we don't believe what we have belongs to God. We believe it belongs to us. And this story that Jesus is telling Um, helps their mind shift. And my mindset um, to convert from owner to manager and my attitude and approach to using resources changes. So look what else happens here. The faithful managers are rewarded with more. While listening to Jesus' story here, he's going to tell the rest of the story. I would like you to try something. Try inserting yourself in the story. I'm one of these servants. Put yourself there on the, on the scene. He wants you to insert yourself and try to kind of analyze which disciple am I. And, and, you know, maybe like me when you first read that, you're like, I know I'm already the one bad guy. I already know. I don't need to think about it. But think about it. There's two managers. We're going to see that there's two managers, but we're also going to see that there's a third manager. So the first manager, of course, is maximum investor, five bags. And second manager is kind of like mid manager. They get two bags. So here's the story. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. Probably bought a Bitcoin. Wouldn't you think? Right at the beginning. Right at the beginning. He bought mine. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Investment and work. Earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid the master's money. Maximum investor, middle worker, and a third hider. Bury it. And the two faithful servants immediately put the master's talents to work or his wealth to work, doubling what they received. And it becomes a powerful picture of what it means to live as faithful managers. Investor, worker. Investor, worker. A powerful picture of what it looks like to be faithful stewards. And we're not made just to save or maintain or protect and preserve what God has given us, but we're made as disciples, our hearts start to change and we become investors and workers of what we've been given to see it make an impact. Faithful management is using our gifts for God's purpose and trusting him with the results, taking some risks, getting out of our comfort zone, making investments, doing whatever we can to see the resources that God has given us grow and also bear fruit. After a long time, their master returned from his trip, and he called them to give an account of how they had used his money. The servant 
to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest and I've earned five more. The servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward earned what they had done with the master's wealth. And Jesus helps us see here that those who are faithful and responsible investors and workers with the possessions, the the resources that God has given them should expect a reward. They should expect some kind of response from the master. In fact, what they receive is the joy of the master's praise. And how many of you have ever had someone that you worked for, someone who maybe was your teacher, principal, or maybe a um, someone you lived with, and when they said something to you like, good job, you were floored. You thought to yourself, what? Did I just hear that right? Somehow what they praised you for had weight. Imagine the creator of the universe eventually saying to you, um, something positive, affirming, uh, expressing that you have brought joy. You yourself have caused the master's praise and celebration for your wise management and experiencing greater levels. This is what disciples can experience, greater levels of reward and greater levels of joy. The master who was full of praise, after hearing about the five and the two, multiplying, doubling what they have, well done. Well done. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now, I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. What a great day. What a great experience for the servants. What a thrill to be a part of the master saying, everybody get together, we're going to celebrate. Why? Because these faithful servants have been obedient and faithful and taken responsibility for what I left for them, and they have turned it into even more of my resources. And faithful givers, faithful stewards, faithful managers, it's not just about responsibility It's about joy. And the affirmation that God gives as he invites us into a deeper satisfaction of seeing his kingdom grow through our faithfulness. And when we give well, we participate in God's eternal purposes. God has a plan to do something that matters in eternity. And when we are faithful uh, givers and we are faithful managers, we participate in what his plan is for eternity. Also, we share in the joy of his mission. We don't have to wait until the end. We get to share in the joy even more in the age to come when at some point or other we hear Jesus, our rescued king, our, our joy and our love say to us, well done. Well done. Nothing motivating knowing that the master of the universe who created everything by the word of the power and holds it all together by the same turns to a servant and says, he's done well. He's been faithful. You've demonstrated your faith. that way. And Jesus' followers, who are building their own kingdom treasure, they instead are devoted to the praise and glory of their fans and their followers, more than they are the praise that comes from God. So question, what's holding you back? If you think of yourself as one of these two one of these two managers. What's holding you back? What's the hesitation? What's the obstacle that is in the way from investing your life wisely for God's kingdom? Your life, your resources, what you have and who you are, what's holding you back? I know the answer. For many of us, the answer is fear. And it is the fear that I won't have enough to live. The fear that there's going to be a point in time where I have given away so much that I'm forever stuck in poverty or there's not enough left for my basic needs. And I think that is a natural and normal fear, natural and normal expectation that if I 
give away what I have, doesn't it, isn't it possible that I short myself? God wants me to have my basic needs. But wait, there's more to the story. Look at this. To those who use well what they are given, even more. You say that with me? Even more. Even more will be given to those who use well what they have been given. Even more will be given, and they will have how much? You see this position? This means I really mean it. (laughs) Sorry about that. An abundance. What does an abundance mean? Overflowing. The more you give, what do we see here? The more God gives you. I have never, I've been doing this a long time, and do you know I've never talked to, I've never sat with anybody and said, I'm really struggling with my finances, we can't make ends meet, and it's actually, we've slipped into poverty, and we can't meet our basic needs. Why? I've given away so much money to God. No, I've never heard that. I've never, ever, ever, ever heard that. Now, I do think that if that ever happened, that'd be a weird, weird thing to say to the pastor, wouldn't it? So maybe that's why no one's ever said it to me, but I think it's just a biblical truth that when you open your hands and give, you know what God does with it? He fills it right back up. Abundantly, overflowing. So what does that mean? Sometimes, as managers, the reason we have little is because we give little. The reason why our hands aren't full is because they're closed and in our hands is what we were given at the beginning and we're still protecting it. Out of what? Out of fear. And here's what Jesus is saying. You can be sure If you become a manager and you become an investor and you are a working servant, then you can expect that even more will be given to you and that there will will be an abundance. Jesus says this, well done. You're spending it well. You're investing it well. More for you. More for you. Expect even more. investing in my kingdom is the degree in which it will come to you and then begin to overflow. Question, for those of you who have invested and you have used the master's wealth, um, you can look at, see what has happened, right? You don't have less. If you have been faithfully investing and giving, you find yourself with more. And I think that it's possible to say this, that you find yourself with even more, even more than I had, even more than I started with. And why will even more come your way? Why will you have more than when you started? Well, this is what Randy Alcorn says. Randy Alcorn says, God prospers us, abundance, right, not to raise our standard of living. Why does he do it? To raise our standard of giving. We get more so that we can give more, so that God's kingdom can advance and expand. And we're a part of it. We get to share in that, knowing that we receive the reward of the master's praise. But what does the third servant discover? Okay, so you know how typically I'm kind of like talking through the message and I get to a point where I'm like, all right, there's a twist in the plot. You know that part? This is the part where the twist in the plot is ugly. I mean, it's, it's ugly. So, I don't know, brace yourself for this. But it's in the story. And when I think about this particular parable that Jesus teaches, I often think to myself, did I miss this part for a long time? Or was this part left out? Was this part skipped over? And there's a reason why, because we get to see about the third servant who discovers something pretty painful. It's the one servant who, is, who made their decision based on fear and apathy. 